the last session of the day. We are the last session between you and happy hour. So, <laughs> but good afternoon. We are pleased to have you join us for this topic that is near and dear to all of our hearts on this stage, uh, centering and amplifying student voice and choice. This panel will focus on identifying the student perspective of education and to understand how they learn best. My name is Dwayne McClary. I am the Senior Director of Networks and Partnerships at Digital Promise. Um, as Senior Director, I oversee the League of Innovative Schools, Ed Camps, uh, Corporate Partnerships for Digital Promise, and the newly launched League of Innovative Students. Uh, on April 24th, 2022, Digital Promise hosted the first ever Students for Equitable Education Summit, also affectionately known as C Summit. The C Summit was a student-led movement calling for equitable education that values, honors, and affirms the identity of every student. The C Summit is a national social justice movement and summit that envisions and led by students from districts across the country. Today, we are honored to have two of our C Summit, C -Summit students from last year who are student leaders and joining us on our panel. We have uh, Ms. Andrea Della Victoria. She is a current student at Grand Canyon University, but a proud member of a League of Innovative Schools, Roland Unified School District. We also have Ms. Isabella Ortega. She is a student at UCLA and a proud student of Santa Ana Unified School District. So those are the only important people up here, you know. That's right. <laughs> yep. That's cool. But we also have a few other folks up here, important folks on this, on this stage. Uh, Mr. Marlon Stiles, he is the uh, superintendent of Middletown School District, who is a proud league member, and also a C Summit advisor and leader, one of our founding members for the C Summit. We also have Ms. Julie Mitchell, who is a proud League of Innovative School member, uh, Roland Unified School District superintendent, and who is also a C Summit leader, advisor, and founder of C Summit. And last but not least, we have a very important thought partner with us and corporate partner of Digital Promise, who has pretty much, I love the name of their organization, Learner Centered Collaborative, because that is what they do. They live and breathe that. Ms. Katie Martin, Chief Impact Officer, thank you for coming. So let's dive right in. Isabella and Andrea, what impact did the C Summit have on you? And I'll start with you. Hello. So for me, the impact of the C Summit was really big. It was an eye opener to be able to express my experiences as a student in high school and my experiences with really great teachers who helped me learn, who helped me get through social and emotional problems in order to prepare myself for the academics and prepare myself for greater education. And it also helped me realize the things that needed to change about education and the things that I could do as a student to help teachers who just don't understand what are the problems students are facing to this day. Isabella? Hi, um, so throughout the C Summit, I felt very empowered. Um, I hear a lot of you know, older adults that say, yes, you know, go ahead, youth can do something, but oftentimes we aren't given that space to actually do something. And through the C Summit, I was given that space in order to be heard and you know, put out my ideas of how education can be someone for me with intersecting identities and someone um, you know, coming from different backgrounds and also my peers. So just being able to rethink how schooling is and see how I as a student can take um, control of that and you know, make the educational beneficial for me and my experience as I grow, you know, as I grow and go beyond that. So just being able to take advantage of that and being able to take ownership of my education. So both of you were seniors when C Summit came about. Like you already had your life ahead of you thinking about that. But I want to ask you another question. Um, what would you say your peers would have thought, have thought um, on the state of education and wanted to begin their advocacy journey? What would you tell your peers about that? I would say to just get started, start those conversations. I know it's pretty scary to, um, you know, go ahead and talk to administration or adults. So just get started even with talking to your peers about, you know, what are some of the things that you realize that maybe don't fit well? 
So starting with those discussions among your peers, then builds that confidence to move on from having those discussions and going on to administration, going on to you know, how you can make these changes. But just starting simple with discussions brings the topic at hand um, and then really you know, gets the ball rolling a little bit. And then for me, of course, we were seniors during a pandemic, so it was very different. And I'm glad I had my group of friends and my support system that was already built. So it was easier for me to just have those conversations of, hey, this is a pandemic. We don't know what's happening. We don't know how to change from learning in person in the class to all of a sudden everything's online. Everything, you have to go to Zoom. What if we don't have Wi-Fi? What if there's a blackout? We were texting each other and we were talking to each other. But it was also good that I had a good relationship with certain teachers to where I felt comfortable to be like, hey, I don't really understand this in class, but I feel awkward asking online, asking on Zoom, because no one has their camera on. Like the teachers, of course, they ask at the beginning of class, please turn your camera on during attendance so she could see that we're here. But after that, turn their camera off. Who knows if you're paying attention, if you're sleeping. And it's so awkward asking the question, unmuting. So I have a question, whereas in class, just raise your hand. Hey, I don't get this. And you can stop and you can learn. So just adjusting to that and having the already good relationship with your teachers, your students, it's just, it's the foundation for helping get through different times. So Julie and Marlon, I wanna ask you a question. So when you guys were thinking about the C Summit, what made you want to do this? So I, um, I received a call from Marlon, and he said, hey, I've got this idea about really elevating student voice. Um, and what do you think? And I said, yeah, that sounds, that's right up my alley. That sounds great. Um, we had really no idea what we were doing, um, except for the passion that we had about making sure that students' voices were heard and that we empowered them, as Isabel had shared. Um, and we were really thankful for our partnership with Digital Promise to be able to have it come to life and have a full platform. So there were uh, nine school districts from six different states, 54 students who participated in the C Summit, supported by a great number of adults who served as coach facilitators for their entire role was to open up the doors for students and to create opportunities for students to share their story for the goal that we can improve our work. So it was students teaching educators um, for us to be able to improve our schools and our districts to better serve their needs. So from that phone call, then it built and it built, and here we are, ready for C Summit 2. Yeah. Ju Julie answered the phone. I think that was her first mistake, Dwayne. <laughs> I actually texted Dwayne early this morning and said I got another idea. So oh, no. I'll call you on how about Thursday, if that's all right, Dwayne. <laughs> uh, for me, um, got to block the number now. Every, everything that Julie said. Uh, for me, as a black male, I know when George Floyd was murdered, that's when it just hit me hard. And I, and I remember just sitting there about what can I do, what can I do, what can I do? And Katie always says, create the conditions. And I remember one day she said very bluntly to me, she's in our district. So I started thinking about how can we create a condition where our students can address some of the social justice issues that they are facing inside the walls of our schools. And the idea of a student-led conference, AKA C Summit. And then I called Julie. Yeah, it, it was powerful. Um, when Marlon and Julie came with the idea, I was like, okay. So we were thinking, oh, this is gonna be on Zoom, we're gonna invite some kids, and it's gonna be about 20 of us, and that was it. Lo and behold, we put out the feelers, and we had over 950 people around the US and outside of the country to register. Zoom couldn't hold that. <laughs> so we had to actually purchase a platform for that, and it was so great to see. When we first started, we had like one panel of Zoom kids to like the next session where we invited more volunteers, we went to like six panels of kids on Zoom. And it was just phenomenal to see, you know, black kids, white kids, Asian kids, Arab kids, all talking about what education should look like moving forward. That was powerful. So I'm, I'm gonna stop talking. Um, question for Julie, Martin, and Katie. What advice do you have for your school communities uh, who would like to replicate 
or host a C-Summit or a similar event in the future in their communities. And Katie, also from your perspective at a national level, what have you seen? And I'll start with you, Katie. Sure, I'll jump in. Um, you know, listening, being a participant and just listening to the C Summit and hearing the voices of students was so powerful. Just because you saw how articulate they were, things that they cared about, and what really mattered to students. So when we see this on a national level, um, you know, we were talking about this earlier in our conversation that everyone's here is working really hard. Educators are working harder than ever, but sometimes we're not actually in tune with what students need. We're working based on our own preconceptions of what school should be, what we needed, and just stopping to ask students to connect. How did that work? What do you need? What are your questions? What are you struggling with? Can be such a powerful force for innovation, for change, and really just actually meeting the needs of young people. That's what we're all here to do. So some of the things that we've seen, students, you know, empathy interviews, pulling some kids aside and doing some interviews, 30 minutes um, can make a world of difference. Student observations or shadow with student days are so, so powerful. Um, and then just coming in and getting panels Every time we do design, graduate profile, all the way to implementation, we're always trying to include students to get their voices to make sure that they're aware of what we're trying to do, but also providing that perspective of um, what we're missing from the adult lens. I would add, just be intentional about who's at the table. Um, we all in here probably have a diversity, equity, inclusion plan or an initiative, or we're going through training with our staff. So I would just be intentional about who's at the table. Uh, for us, as we have more dialogue, and I think the more we get around the children across the country in the Sea Summit, we're finding they've got a lot to teach us yeah. about how we can create more inclusive classrooms and school buildings. So be intentional about who's delivering the content, who's creating the content, create the space, and then just very bluntly, I put it, Dwayne, just get out of the way and stop talking um, and just invite some educators into the room and just listen and learn um, and try to seek some type of shift in behavior after you get the content from the experts, yeah. which are not us. Julie, could you also share a little bit about some topics that the kids came up with? Sure, so from the beginning, the students, um, the students came up with the title, the students came up with the topics, the students designed all of the content that was delivered. It was their conference, and they were empowered to do this. And again, as it was shared, it was in the middle of, of remote learning and COVID and so forth. And so these students met each other from across the nation, had little groups. It wasn't a topic was made up of students from all of these different school districts because it was their topic that they were interested in. So some of the topics were understanding Black Lives Matter. Some of them were looking at roles of discipline. Some of them had to do with gender equity and understanding... Um, what were some of the others? Cl I'm classroom sure. assimilation. Classroom assimilation, bias. Real talk. There you go. There, yeah. yeah. Your, your topics. Critical consciousness. Okay. And these were students leading the conversation. Like it was powerful. It was, yeah. Yeah, so I think just if you hear those topics, um, if they make you uncomfortable, you should have a C-Summit in your school district. Mm -hmm. um, if you hear those topics and they don't make you uncomfortable, you should have a C-Summit, <laughs> right, in your district, right? So l listen to the topics. This isn't some consultant coming in to talk about DEI training for your staff one time, sit and get for an in-service date, and then they split. Um, but think about what kids have on their minds. They're sitting in our classrooms trying to access learning, and there are some things that are limiting their experiences in the classroom. So um, you talked about advice before. I said you have to have the courage, no matter what the community may say um, or what they may not say or what they may do, but have the courage to get into the, as they say, the real um, conversations about the topics that are in the kids' mind, but the courage is gonna be a big one. I wanted to jump in on that because I often hear educators in a lot of professional development talk about, I create a safe space for my students, right? They name that, they say that, they truly believe and want to create that safe space but they don't often ask students, is this a safe space? And it's, it's an uncomfortable feeling to have to confront that, but until you actually talk to students and wonder and ask, do you feel safe? What do you need to feel included? What is missing from this space? Then we are not being totally inclusive in creating those conditions so that all students can be seen and feel valued unless we're actually bringing them to the table to find out what, it, what they need um, to make those conditions right. One of the things that also happened last year that as, as an adult I wasn't expecting because our whole goal was 
we were going to get out of the way and the students would take charge and they would be able to, to lead and share with us. And so as we were getting to know each other and talking and meeting all through Zoom and so forth, um, we were, the students spoke up and said, you know, we're not comfortable being vulnerable until you are vulnerable. They wanted to hear from us because our goal was we weren't going to talk. We were going to let them do this. And so they needed us to show them, show the way that, you know, everything isn't always as perfect as it may look or as, as designed as it may look. And, and every, everybody, everyone, and every situation, every system has a flaw. And so they wanted us to share that. And once that happened, then, then we backed up. And they're like, okay, we can really say what's on our mind. We can really say that what we've designed in public education doesn't always work for students. And they were very comfortable with the adults in the room to be very candid and honest with us. And I, I believe I learned, I would say more than what the students did. I was, they taught me so much. Yeah. Ditto. Yeah. <laughs> I, I even, I even taught, thought to myself and I told the panel, uh, I wonder what was I doing <laughs> at that age when I was in school, it wasn't this. <laughs> so it's probably trying to chase somebody to kiss them or something, I don't know. <laughs> good job, <laughs> it's good job. <laughs> um, back to Isabella. And <laughs> that was not part of our agenda. That was not, agenda. <laughs> not scripted. That's, get back to the cue cards. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> Just being honest. <laughs> Marlon, what were you doing? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's go. <laughs> Microphone right. not working. All right, let's go back to the students. Um, <laughs> before we get in trouble, <laughs> digital prompts will not be back. <laughs> right there. As students, uh, who led this work from the beginning? Uh, as you said, we, we gave you guys uh, the platform and the opportunity to lead. Uh, why was this important? to share your perspective on social justice and equity? And uh, how do you foresee your work continuing in the future? Uh, for me, education has been my outlet since I was really young. Uh, my mom uh, had a stroke when I was really young, so I had to take uh, responsibility for my younger sister, who's 10 years old. And um, so uh, education, I knew that was the way that my family could have a better future. And I started, I had to start that pathway. So because I knew that that was so important for my future, I also knew it was important for my sister's future and even my community. So it was really important for me to make sure that our stories are being told in these spaces so that my sister feels empowered to also go through education and continue that pathway. So just putting those perspectives out there and showing that we are here and the power that we hold as students and, and just as a community moving forward was very important so that, you know, the future looks different and it looks student-led and is for the students. So it was just very important um, that I, you know, take that step forward. Well said. <laughs> But for me, I always grew up knowing that me, myself, I wanted to be an educator and I wanted to work with kids. So it was important for me just to take that moment, that opportunity that you guys gave us to reflect on my own experiences as of what do I want when I am a teacher? What do I want from my teachers? How can I be supported by the people who want to support me? Because sometimes I know these teachers are genuine and I know they want to help, but sometimes there's that cultural difference, there's that generational difference of just, I just didn't grow up in the same tech, with the same technology you did. I didn't grow up with the same experiences you did. So it's just being able to open up and to share my experience, to hear feedback from other adults, and just to develop my ideas into a way that there can be change. Because sometimes you think about all the things that need to change, but it feels so far off and so unattainable that it's just defeating. But being able to state that this needs to change and having backup from teachers, having backup from adults saying that yes, 
we can change. It feels great to know that, and I, it's great to know that for other students and for myself. So I wanna say this, um, Andrea has already been committed <laughs> by another superintendent, because she's, she's in school to be a teacher, so superintendents back off. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> She, she's, already, she's already got a sign, <laughs> almost. <laughs> Marlon, Julie, and Katie, what, pres uh, what response or feedback uh, did you receive for, from parents, family, peers, community, board members, other community members about the C-Summit, or any of the equity work for Student Center? I would, I would just say um, I've had a number of folks uh, just across the network who have reached out to say they'd like to do something um, in their district. So when we got into this business, Julie and I, before we invited anyone to the table, we said we are committing no matter what uh, that the students' voices are amplified, uh, pre-event, during the event, and post-event. Um, so the exciting piece, selfishly, I'm, I, I think my partner's on the same page, is um, after the event, all the calls that came in about can we get your C Summit students to come to, to our district? Um, USA Today reaching out. We want to interview some some people about C Summit go straight to the kids, or we're doing webinars. So the the excitement around the event itself was nice, uh, but for me, I think the the most rewarding piece was that a they had the space, but their voices were amplified, and they continue to be amplified. So as we walk into C Summit two, infomercial on your seat, um, as we walk into C Summit two, looking for sponsors to amplify the kids' voices, I think is the the biggest piece. Now it's always nice when people take it back and try to do different PD in their district, but um, there's some powerful kids that were part of C-Summit too, and, and to have folks continue to give them spaces was, was pretty exciting. Awesome. Julie? Now, I, I would agree in terms of those opportunities for students um, to guest lecture at schools, and they've gone to colleges and, and lectured in college classes to in teacher education programs. Um, articles were written, some students writ some, had written some papers, and they were published based on their um, experiences in the C-Summit. And so, but your question in terms of what were some of the feedback, uh, I, I had the opportunity to have an interesting conversation with the board, with our board of education about that this was gonna be the involvement that I would like to have in our district and inviting our students to participate and the role that I was going to play um, because some of those courageous pieces of making sure that, that this is gonna be very public and we're having this conversation and why we're having this conversation because this is important work and this is the only reason we're here is for students and so let's, Let's meet their needs. Um, so I had the opportunity to um, educate, work with, share with the Board of Education, who was 100% in support, um, signed up for C-Summit, uh, attended C-Summit, made donations to C-Summit. Um, and so it was, very, it was very powerful in terms of the learning in our local community with the board that helps lead the work in our school district. Yeah, I would just echo that and say anytime I hear adults in schools listen to students and create that space, there's always a little bit of trepidation. What are they going to say? I don't know. It's a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and every time they lean into it and create the space for that discomfort and truly listen, they're always amazed. Always amazed by the perspective, the ideas, and the willingness of students and what's possible when you start to have those conversations together. Um, and I think the more and more we create the space and have those conversations, we can all collectively see what's possible. And, and it just starts to open up that perspective, like, I didn't even know that that's what you were experiencing. I had no idea that this policy or that schedule created hardships. These simple things that are structural, but also um, understanding how students feel and belong, I think. Um, when you raise the bar and you allow students to step up, um, they almost always exceed it. The other piece that happened is how much the students educated, not only myself, but other teachers from the district that participated in the C-Summit, because the students were very willing to answer questions. So there are experiences that they have had that I can't, I, I didn't have, and so I didn't always understand. And so I needed to be vulnerable and explain to them, I. I don't have that same experience, can you share more? And asking more and more clarifying questions to better understand, and other adults doing the same thing, 
um, and really reversing that because sometimes it's the thought, well, the teacher has the knowledge, the teacher has the information, but we don't have all of the answers, obviously. We don't have all of the information, and students did such a phenomenal job teaching us, and in this case, teaching me. Thank you for that. Katie, um, Learner Center Collaborative has taken the concept of student-informed practices and prototyping for professional learning uh, that centers student voice and engage students as experts. What motivated you guys to, to pioneer this work, and what does it look like in schools? Well, I think as I kind of mentioned earlier that we're all here for students, right? If we're in education, we care about the future of students. We go into this work because we want to create opportunities and we want students to be able to navigate their own path. And sometimes, oftentimes, the way we do school often prevents those opportunities that we actually care about. So we've created those spaces intentionally when we partner with school districts to include students, to include families, to include community members, so that we're having these conversations out in the open before we start designing what we think we should be doing. We actually are stepping back to say, what do students need? What is the current experience? And is there a better way that we aren't currently thinking about? So starting with the student perspective, and really if you're learner-centered, that's what we truly believe is you start with the learners. You start with the experience, you start with the outcomes you truly want, and then start designing from there. And so it's not having, here's where we're going, and we're just like marching on that path. We're listening, we're always trying to understand and empathize, um, and looking how we collectively get better. So that's, again, those the design sessions, it's empathy interviews, it's observations, shadowing a student, it's creating those experiences and co-designing, and like Julie said, not having all the answers, but really trying to collectively figure out what those best experiences are, um, and knowing that as adults, just because we've gone through the system, we don't necessarily know exactly how it needs to be in the future. So going to the, the student agency and student voice, Marlon and Julie, I know you guys, when ed tech companies approach you, what would you like for them to know about the work for student voice and choice and selection of content? I would start with ed tech companies because they often will call and say, oh, we're, we're developing this program, this platform, this app, this curriculum, whichever, um, and we'd like to, it's for student voice. And so my question is, how many students helped you design it? That's usually what we hear, the nothing. And so if you're really truly looking to design curriculum, apps, programs, technology for students, ask students, have them at the table with you in the design stages, in the brainstorming stages, in the idea phase, um, because that doesn't often happen. Yeah, so I'm gonna expand on that, sure, same passion behind that. Um, a little more specific, I, I would say, it's okay to bring a group of black male students to the table, right, in this co-design space. It's okay to bring transgender students to the table and create a space for them to give us input. It's okay, and I go on and on and on about different student groups. Um, I, I mean, shame on me, I need to do a better job at that myself. Um, so as we're going through different adoption processes or entertaining new platforms, um, I do wish we'd do exactly that, right? Answer that question, but before we get there, can we start co-designing together? Um, I enjoy the, the fun question of, show me the data that your algorithms work Right, and I don't want to go down the rabbit hole, but but show me the show me the data, right? That that doesn't say that we've got an achievement gap for our, our students of color, uh, because every time we purchase a platform, every time you get into the data, the data tells the same story. So, um, I think it's a unique perspective that they gave us, um, the students themselves, that could be very beneficial to any vendor in the room or in the summit, ASU GSB summit, uh, but to get perspective from a diverse group of students that have a lot to offer about. Um, the design of, of said educational platform and how it might impact the learning. So I'm going to go back to the students. What would you like for education to look like? So for me, as a future educator, <laughs> I would just like it to look like genuine relationships between students and teachers because that's when students trust their teachers to teach them and to open their, their minds to ideas that they never really thought about. 
And we spend so much time in the classroom that sometimes when things are happening in the world, we need someone to talk to. We need an adult to look up to. When there's major news events, we want to talk about it. And having that trusted adult have those conversations with us and have those, okay, this is what we're learning academically, but realistically, how does that apply to us? And being comfortable with actually having those conversations in a space where you know you're not judged for any idea, because all ideas matter from all voices. And to echo that, I would say genuine and also just having a sense of comfort in the sense of like having also the stories of different communities being told. It's time that we move from the generic perspective onto our population now, which is of very diverse folks and groups. So, you know, we need to change that. And in, in order to do that, you know, it starts with the curriculum, starts with hearing the stories of different students, their perspectives, their experiences, which then can translate into feeling comfortable in sharing with our teachers, having those connections and being able to build from that and feeling comfortable to, you know, tell your teacher, like I know during the pandemic for myself, internet access was something that was very hard. Even during the C summit, sometimes I would get kicked out a couple of times and I had to get logged back in. Um, and just talking to administration and being able, is there a possibility to get hotspots? So in order to create those relationships, it starts by, you know, seeing that the curriculum is also for us um, in order to, expand on that and feel comfortable with, you know, creating those connections with people in the educational field. I'm going to come back to Julie and Marlon. Um, how have you begun to address the inequities of educational structures, policies, procedures in your district that was informed by your participation in leading the C-Summit? Tough one. Yeah. Let's see. So I, I can say very humbly, I have not been as successful as I would like to be. Um, it, it starts with mindset and really um, changing an organization and um, sharing. Not everyone in the district had the opportunity to hear from the students. Um, and so there still are some barriers that are there. And mindset is that biggest barrier. Um, and on top of that, lots of other things that educators are working through and dealing with right now, um, but that is an excuse, and we need to do better. So we will hear the, that often, well, I can't handle this right now because I have all these other things on my plate. Well, you're not going to do very well on these other things on your plate if you're not addressing this one first because you need to know your students as people first and then as learners. Um, and so we have taken small small steps, I'll say small, um, in conversations with different groups, um, in conversations with our leadership team, working through. Um, our directors have done an amazing job leading some really great conversations about meeting students' needs. Um, and so that ball is rolling, um, and we'd like to see it continue to roll. Yeah, we found some inspiration from the children. Um, we are I think we're about a month away from being ready to introduce uh, a campaign in our district for more black male educators. Uh, some inspiration for folks like Baron Davis down at uh, Richland Two in South Carolina. Uh, but, but really focusing in on things that we've heard from the children time and time again and really trying to just hunker down and double down on those areas. So um, a campaign for black male educators in our district, infomercial for Digital Promise. Um, we are offering an incentive right now for every employee in our district. Uh, to obtain a micro-credential that is DEI related uh, under Digital Promises micro-credentials. Um, huge shout out to our Board of Education for making that a priority in our latest negotiations. Moving away from awareness, right, receiving content, becoming more aware of our, our, our biases and, and things of that nature to uh, transforming our classroom behavior. So it, it's our commitment to our community and our children uh, by really doubling down on these micro-credentials to, to see if that does translate and to practice uh, shifts at the classroom level. I'm really anxious what the next couple years bring. Katie, where do you see a sweet spot for student-centered voice for districts? What do I see a sweet spot? Well, I mean, getting into the classroom I was just in Marlin's district last last month. Getting in to see, it's, it's one thing to look at the policy level and I appreciate the perspective and the work that they're doing as superintendents. And also you can forget 
their kids are doing amazing things in your schools and classrooms. And just walking in there to see the joy in their learning, the questions they have. I did school visits this morning at the Met in San Diego. And the teachers were talking about how they prioritize their time. And he was like, I don't teach as much as like a typical teacher would teach, but his time is set out for advisory for students, making those connections and building those relationships. And so if we step back, I've said this to a few people already today and many times over, that if we just probably took away half the things we're doing in education, we'd probably be in a better place than adding anything new. So the sweet spot is really when you're connected and we are really thinking about what we know about learning, what we know about one another, and we're putting that into practice and creating the spaces to actually learn, grow, and do things that are meaningful in the classroom. I have said umpteen million times, and I'll say it that many more, the Gallup poll looks at the, the engagement decline from fifth grade to 12th grade. It continues to decline once we leave school, doesn't dip back up. So if we spend our time in school doing things that we feel successful, have opportunities to do things that we feel good at and that we enjoy and have fun and start doing things that matter more and more um, like you're doing in your classrooms, we're gonna start to see that engagement, connection, and motivation um, in school and beyond. All right, we only have a few more minutes left, so we're gonna wrap this up with one last question. And I'm gonna ask everyone this question. Where do you see the future of C-Summit and what impact has it had on you? So starting, I feel the future of C-Summit will be forever because students will always be changing. Our voices will always be changing. Our stories will be changing and adapting. And as this goes on, there will be a change in our education system to where it is normal for students to speak up. It is normal for students to use their voices when something isn't right. And although we've been told, like, if you see something, say something, we've also been told, oh, you're too young, you don't know what you're talking about. But having the C Summit here, we're learning, no, we did see it. We can talk about it. On a, on a similar note, um, I would say the C Summit, the conferences and the summits that are happening on right now is just the beginning of the long journey that's going to continue on and centering the student voices and expanding throughout the nation so that it is normal for students to be at the core and be in these spaces and have these conversations and be able to take part of you know what they're learning and what their education looks like. So this is the beginning and as we move forward it will change, it will move on and we'll see that students are the ones that are taking the hold of their education with the support of educators, with the adults, and you know, coming at a, at a spot where education is for everyone um, and not just for a selected few. All right, Adelch, I gotta top that. Go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say thank you for coming. Uh, I was just gonna <laughs> leave it right at that. Um, well, May 14th is the C-Summit 2, so that's the next one. We have um, significantly increased the numbers of districts that are participating, the numbers of students, and the numbers of states that are represented. So it's May 14th, little infomercial. You have a flyer, a, a postcard on your chair there. So please um, plan to join us on that Saturday. Um, and we are very much looking forward to the opportunity to bringing C-Summit in person. So May 14th is virtual but we are looking for the opportunity for these amazing students who, to work together throughout a period of months and then come and actually meet each other in person. These two ladies met each other in person today for the first yes. time. Um, and so the, the ability for them to share this in a conference just like what we're participating at ASU GSV. Piggyback off of uh, Julie here, just a quick couple seconds. Uh, sponsorships, we are looking for sponsorships for C-Summit 2 and beyond, primarily just to amplify the student's voice pre and post event. Um, so if you're interested in coming on board, please reach out to one of the, somebody up here on the stage, uh, webinars, articles, uh, interviews, you name it, whatever you've got, reach out to, uh, to us, that way we can amplify what the kids have to say. I'll let you 50 seconds. Thank you. <laughs> I would just say I'd circle back to 
Andre and Isabel, that the, the future of this is when student voices are centered in all of our schools, that the summit is a celebration of what's happening day in and day out in our classrooms because it's an opportunity for students to see their voice, use their voice, and make that impact. And so I think it's a model not only at a national level, but one that can be brought into every single district to guide their decisions. And we do offer a signing bonus in Middletown City Schools, just for the record. <laughs> <laughs> so they're already fighting over the yeah. students. So I will say this, uh, as you guys have heard, you know, centering student voice is important. There's so many times we've heard districts say, you know, my curriculum is by students for students, but you've never talked to a student a day in your life. How do we, how are you gonna create products and ensure that kids are doing right and doing things by them when you don't even have conversations with them? So it's very important that as you're developing products, strategies, and in, in, in there's no way for us to get out of this achievement gap, but us working and bringing students to the table to actually have a voice in what their education look like. Because remember, they're the end users of everything that we create. So remember that, and a shameless plug for Digital Promise, because of this great work for C-Summit, we have launched what we call the League of Innovative Students this, this month, and the League of Innovative Students will be at the forefront and having a voice in all of the R&D work also helping us um, working with our League of Innovative Students, I mean League of Innovative Schools with our superintendents, and they'll be at the table uh, to also help us with some ed tech products. So we look forward to that kicking off, and because of these great people on this panel, I would just like to say thank you, thank you, thank you, and we could not have done this without you. All right, and my final words for those who know me, um, Continue to do right by students. Uh, and if you want, there's some swag on the back. Please feel free to grab some swag and some cards. And we look forward to seeing you guys around ASU GSV.